Thank you. Thank you for surviving lunch and for coming here. This is like the worst session. Like, I don't even want to be in this session. The other two are much better. Um, but um, uh, I'm biased because I already know what I'm going to be talking about. Um, but uh, but uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for picking uh, this one. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, uh, some stuff that's kind of an update uh, from where we were uh, last year. Last year, uh, I gave a talk along with uh, Hari Hursty and Maggie and very briefly Sandy uh, about the voting village uh, at DEF CON and the results from that and our opportunities to, to, to look at voting machines, sort of opening that to the public for the, for the first time. And I ended on a slightly hopeful note. Um, I said I'm less pessimistic than I've been in the 20 years that I've been uh, working on this. Um, and I want to uh, basically uh, recap uh, and ask the question, you know, was I right or wrong to be less pessimistic? And I think the answer is very clearly I was. Um, so <coughs> uh, first of all, just a kind of overview of the landscape that we're talking about. Um, early elections in the United States, and by early, what I really mean is, is through the first hundred years or so of the uh, United States' existence, elections were a pretty casual thing. Um, in most places, um, an election consisted of the male landowners showing up at the town hall and kind of raising their hands. Um, so there was no idea of universal uh, uh, suffrage. There was no idea of a secret ballot. And uh, it was very much done by consensus. Um, this mostly went away not as much because of a sense of fairness, although um, you know, there were certainly issues around the 14th Amendment that uh, pushed it in that direction, but really uh, because of the scale of the United States. Um, so we were really forced to go to use technology in elections, um, largely because there was no alternative. Uh, simply doing things by raising your hands in the town hall didn't scale to the needs uh, of the logistics of elections as they, uh, as they were increasingly um, uh, becoming. And so voting mechanisms became important, um, and they became kind of fundamental to elections. Um, in the first voting technology uh, used in this country and, and many other places were paper ballots put into a ballot box. Um, and that has some interesting properties. Um, if you have a paper ballot put into a ballot box that everyone sees is empty at the beginning of the day, um, and uh, you watch the ballot box throughout the day, and you let anybody at the polling place watch it, and then at the end of the day, everybody uh, watches as the ballot box is emptied, and the ballots are individually counted and can be shown and scrutinized by everybody, that has a, a very interesting set of properties. First it really makes it very difficult to cheat on what the count was because everything was being watched. Now, you know, there are sleight of hand things that you might do. You might try to slip a couple of ballot bo ballots in the ballot box, or you might try to take a ballot out of the ballot box or what have you, or you might run off with the ballot box in the middle of the election. But um, you can, you know, help protect those things by working harder at the scrutiny. Um, and it's, uh, you know, there's no kind of catastrophic failure that lets you uh, attack every ballot box in the country. Um, so one property is that it, it, it's pretty reliable. You can be pretty sure if you put a ballot box in, it got counted at the end of the day and that only the voters got to put the ballots in the ballot box if you watch the whole process. At the same time, it also provides this side effect property that we have come to understand as being critically important, which is that your ballot is secret. We know what all the ballots were, but we can't tell who cast any individual uh, paper ballot unless uh, you know, we've done something to individualize them and we can you know, take steps to make the ballots be uh, difficult to distinguish or difficult to trace back to the voter. So that's a system that, that actually added, almost by accident, this property that we've come to understand as being really fundamental to democracy, which is the secret ballot. Um, 
We've um, moved on in the 20th century in the machine age and the electronic age to using more and more technological mechanisms that attempt to emulate this sort of paper ballot in a ballot box set of properties, but um, um, work better or faster or more, more efficiently in one way or another. Um, one is machine counted ballots, so things like punch card uh, ballots um, or uh, optical scan uh, ballots. Um, more recently, it's kind of a 21st century um, property, or late 20th century, mid 20th century property, sorry, is the direct recording voting machine, a mechanical machine that has a little counter in it that records the tally internally rather than on paper. And then finally, um, the 21st century voting technology, and evident, evidence that progress is not monotonic, are the voting computers. Um, uh, that is, direct recording machines that record a vote electronically and um, keep the tally in an internal memory rather than on paper. And one thing I'm going to say is that our confidence in the offices we elect, our confidence in the outcome of the election, is now partly dependent on our confidence in the technology. And as you go down this list of the technologies that have been introduced, they've gotten more and more complex as time has gone on. And a reasonable question to ask is whether the technology we use for elections is worthy of our trust and how can we make it more um, trustworthy. So I will say that I've been working in um, voting and voting security uh, at least some of the time for my professional career over about the last 20 years. And I will, will, will say that hands down, by far, it is the hardest uh, security problem I have ever encountered. Um, with, with nothing coming in second. Um, it, it's much, much harder than anything that I've seen before. And I'm going to identify, there are a bunch of reasons for this. Um, and some of them are, are subtle and things we could maybe do something about, but there are a couple of really fundamental ones, particularly about elections in the United States. Uh, the first is that some of the requirements contradict each other. Um, and, uh, you know, a big one for computing is this secrecy and transparency requirement. We want to be sure our vote was counted, and at the same time, we don't want to be able to have anyone find out who we voted for. And in fact, that's a really strong requirement because we also don't want anybody to be able to prove how they voted to prevent them from being coerced to vote in a particular way. And we've come to understand that as basically a constitutional requirement. Uh, for elections, at least in most uh, states. Um, and at the same time, we want to be sure that every vote is counted. So we want the ability to, to trace a vote to the count, but we don't want to be able to trace a vote back to a voter. And that seems really tough when you add technology to it beyond that paper ballot in the ballot box. Um, but the second problem is even harder than that. Like, you know, that sound, that first one sounds hard, but maybe we could come up with something clever that solves it. There's a second problem, which is that um, th it is almost impossible to have a do-over election if you detect irregularities. That is, um, the security of an election has to not merely detect irregularities, it has to prevent irregularities. And almost all of the computer security technology, particularly uh, uh, things uh, with cryptography involved, are really good at detecting anomalies, but really terrible at preventing them. And um, so our toolkit uh, doesn't actually solve the problem we have. It solves a different problem, which is how do you tell if you need to do the election over? The problem is we mostly can't do elections over. Um, it, it's virtually impossible. It's an incredibly rare uh, occurrence in the United States, also for, for complex but, but really legitimate reasons. Um, and then on top of that, you have a threat environment that uh, is really, really difficult. Historically, uh, threats to elections have been dishonest candidates or dishonest uh, voting officials that have sell, sold offices to people or uh, people who've tried to stuff the ballot to uh, get their candidate uh, uh, an advantage of some kind. Uh, despite the dra drama of presidential elections, historically this fraud has been overwhelmingly in local elections. Um, people who want to get elected dog catcher or mayor or, or, or what have you. Um, those elections um, 
uh, have had a much more colorful history in the, in the outcome being unreliable um, uh, over uh, the course of US history than, than larger scale elections. And that's partly because it's just easier to do. You have to do a lot less work to shift an election one way or another. And that is almost entirely what the legal and procedural mechanisms that we have are aimed at um, discouraging. Um, but we discovered in 2016 that there's an additional part of the threat environment uh, here, which is state actors, um, foreign uh, governments that might want to uh, influence our elections or more seriously simply disrupt them. Um, and so a state actor, an intelligence agency, has an advantage over somebody who wants to steal an election, which is that they might not care who won. It might be that they uh, are simply happy to make us unsure who won, and that does damage to uh, the country. And denial of service uh, is an incredibly difficult uh, problem in computing. So yeah, real quick. Yeah, 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 blah, 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 yeah, 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 gerrymandering, yes. All, there are all sorts of ways in which elections are way worse than anything I'm going to say because there's also this like political environment that they live in and we have things like gerrymandering and access to the polls and all sorts of other things um, that are incredibly hard problems that I'm not even going to go anywhere near. Okay, so, but, but yeah, thank you for pointing out that this is, this is a really tiny little horribly hard fraction of a horribly hard problem. Um, so one question we need to ask as technologists is does new voting tech uh, make uh, fraud and irregularity um, uh, something we're more vulnerable to or less vulnerable to? And it really cuts both ways. There's no great simple answer to this, that technology is great or technology is bad. Uh, this, is, this is a trade-off space that uh, exists on many, many dimensions. Okay, uh, voting in the United States, uh, just a quick overview. It is decentralized but hierarchical, which is to say the federal government has a limited role. It sets very broad standards. The Constitution has almost nothing uh, to say about the details of how elections get uh, conducted. It's, you know, it's, it's, there, there may be five sentences in the, in the U.S. Constitution about uh, about elections, mostly deferring to the states. And the, this has a lot to do with federalism, um, where uh, the, the states do almost all the heavy lifting on the details of this sort of thing. Um, st individual states um, make their own laws, and that also includes the territories and so forth. So basically, there are 54 different sets of election laws in the United States. Um, but elections themselves are run in the vast majority of states by counties. Uh, there are 3,000 counties in the United States, but actually in some states it's a subdivision below the county. So there are somewhere north of 5,000 uh, different entities in the United States that conduct civil elections um, under the laws of whatever state they happen to be in, um, using mostly resources that are at the county level and that are competing for things like road repair and um, opening new firehouses. Um, and so there's, uh, you know, largely a question of how do we pay for these things? Well, we either decide which pothole not to fill or, or which firehouse to close or we raise taxes. And none of those things are, are, are you know, are great. Um, but voting actually takes place in neighborhood uh, precincts, polling places, um, and there may be tens or hundreds or thousands of those in any in individual county and the variance is very high. Uh, also, our elections in the United States are by far the most complex in the world in that we vote for more things than anyone else. Our ballots are not just for one office, our ballots are for all sorts of things ranging from president down to local school board and bond issues um, and so forth. So um, what, uh, you know, in many democracies you vote for your member of parliament, your, your council, local council member, and that's pretty much it. Uh, here, it's a very long multiple choice test um, that uh, is uh, bigger than almost any, anywhere else uh, on the planet. Um, just to give you a sense of what the scale looks like, um, there were in 2016 um, 116,990 physical polling places uh, throughout the United States. 
Um, there were seven, um, uh, 178,217 voting precincts, that is political subdivisions that each have their own unique ballot, which means that at least some polling places had more than one different ballot that the voters might get depending on where they, they live within that polling place. And a huge temporary workforce at any given polling place, there are going to be somewhere between four and ten people whose job that day and that day alone is to help manage the election at that polling place. So we have this half a million or so people uh, who have this one or two day a year job, uh, usually a very long day for low pay and, and, and long hours, um, doing everything from checking voters in um, to the polling place to handing out those coveted I voted stickers uh, as uh, people walk out, um, which is the best job. I strongly recommend you become one of them if you are interested in this. Uh, uh, in this. Um, it, is, it is hard work and, and low or no pay and incredibly rewarding. You will learn a huge amount about how elections actually work on the ground. It is the most efficient way I can think of to, to really learn about voting and voting security. Um, so uh, about 60% of the 139 million ballots were cast on election day in person at a polling place. Um, so about 60% of voters in 2016 voted that way. 17% um, were um, uh, cast of the remaining 40% were cast in person. Um, before election day and 24% were cast by mail either as absentee votes or because uh, that's how this, that particular state did, did it. So basically 82 million Americans voted in person on election day. That means if you kind of do the division an average of about 700 people per polling place. Um, so this is, this is a big problem. Okay, so here's a picture that many of you who are old have, uh, uh, may remember. This is a picture from um, what state? Florida, yeah, and it was used basically in uh, 2000, late 2000, early 2001. The caption of this picture is, look at those idiots in Florida and their primitive voting technology. And it's interesting because the meaning of this picture has kind of turned around 180 degrees since then. And it says, look at the strength of that voting system they were using in Florida. You could look at a ballot that was cast and learn more about it by kind of looking at it harder. And um, this, but this picture was used to illustrate the uncertainty we had about who ha won the Electoral College in Florida uh, because of some interesting problems with a non-computerized voting terminal that was used in Florida uh, to produce a computerized uh, punch card ballot but the actual voting terminal wasn't computerized. And I think this is fascinating. Uh, this is an example of one of these terminals. It's called a vote-o-matic. Uh, it dates from about 1970. It uh, was used for about 35 years throughout the United States. And uh, it basically, you put a punch card in and you take a little stylus and punch a hole through the ballot. And uh, the interesting thing about this machine is the only electricity in the voting booth is used for the lamp uh, that lets you, uh, that illuminates the uh, voting machine so you can see what you're voting for. There is no electronics or even really mechanics in this thing except the mechanism with the little spring to put the card in and the little pegs to hold the card in. And when you vote, what you're doing is effectively the, those, those little holes that you punch the stylus through um, uh, punch a little uh, rectangle uh, through a perforated card that can then be put through a, a Hollerith type card reader and that can produce a tally of the results. So it's very primitive computing technology. The reader for this is basically an optical device that puts light through each hole position and looks to see whether or not the hole is punched out. Um, and there's some simple software that, uh, you know, that uh, uh, produces a tally of the ballots and checks to see if the ballot is spoiled. The interesting thing though, is the voting machine itself, a completely non-computerized device, um, uh, actually has a buffer overflow in it um, or a garbage collection error, which is to say um, there is conservation of matter um, because of physics. Um, those little rectangles that get punched out go somewhere. Where do they go? Well, they actually go right behind where you punched them in. And the, the voting machine has this little rubber strip that they kind of get shoved into when you 
uh, put the ballot through. And the effect is that nor under normal circumstances, if a typical voter turnout, it's just fine. There's plenty of room in there for those little pieces of cardboard. But as the day goes on, if four times more people show up than you were expecting, um, what happens is that those little rectangles, those little cardboard rectangles start to build up behind the more popular candidates. And the more popular the candidate is, the harder they get to vote for at the end of the day because you really have to shove the stylus through. And what might happen is if you're voting at like, you know, an hour before the polls close, um, there might not actually be room for your rectangle behind your preferred candidate unless you have a lot of physical strength. So all you might succeed at doing is kind of dimpling the little rectangle. Or you might create kind of a little flap um, that doesn't actually um, uh, punch out the rectangle, and it might close up by the time it's put through the reader. And it turns out that a really large pr fraction of the ballots cast in a, a couple of precincts in Florida had a huge turnout and ended up either dimpled or hanging. And the, the whole country used, learned the term Chad and dimpled Chad and hanging Chad as we were arguing about how to interpret these, these ballots. But the interesting thing is you could look closer at a ballot and really figure out what was going on. Um, so uh, the country was heavily divided after the 2000 election. It was roughly 50-50. Uh, it was pretty close. Um, and, uh, but we were unified about one thing. This was bad. And Congress passed in 2003 a piece of amazingly bipartisan legislation called the Help America Vote Act. Um, and the Help America Vote Act basically pr provided a big pile of money for states to get rid of non-accessible voting technology, coincidentally, such as was used in Florida, and replace it with technology that could be used by the disabled um, more easily. And effectively, that ended up mandating, if you wanted to spend this pile of money that the federal government was ma making available, you really had to switch over to computerized voting terminals in some way. Um, it would make these, these older systems uh, obsolete. We'd get rid of them. One little problem is that a lot of the equipment that the Help America Vote Act mandated didn't actually exist at the time the legislation was passed. And so industry kind of stepped up and produced these voting, uh, this voting equipment very, very quickly. And so the Help America Vote Act basically allows for three types of voting uh, equipment. The most prominent and the most controversial is the direct recording electronic voting machine, the DRE voting machine, basically a voting computer that stores, usually with a touch screen, that stores the um, uh, vote tally internally. Uh, precinct counted optical scan ballots, that is p uh, paper ballots such as uh, you would fill out for a Scantron machine when you were taking a standardized test in school, um, but uh, you then take your ballot, feed it into a reader, and the ballot is captured but an electronic tally is made. Why is that accessible? It uses paper. Well, there are also ballot printing um, devices that can be used uh, for people who can't use pen and paper, who need an audio interface or what have you, that takes a ballot and, and basically prints the selections on it for submission into the reader. So that's acceptable under Help America Vote. And then finally, some places will use a centrally counted optical scan system, a vote by mail. And that's used for absentee ballots, and in a few states they use it for, uh, for everything. So here's an example of a DRE voting machine. This particular one I like because, first of all, I personally looked at it um, uh, quite a bit, but, but what I really like about it is it's called an iVotronic, uh, lowercase i, capital V, tronic, so it sounds like an Apple product, but it's really just about the opposite of the end of the Apple usability spectrum. Um, and uh, you basically have a touch screen and there's a little interface and you can see some braille keys at the bottom and there's a little jack for putting in a, a headphone so there's an audio interface on it. Um, and then a, a cartridge that's put, put in that enables it for a vote for one voter to use that the poll worker puts in the machine. Now, an observation, which is that this is actually computerized voting. We call these voting machines, but these are really programmable computers um, that are running software. Um, and you, know, you, don't, you can't build a special purpose piece of hardware economically today. What you do is you know, somewhere buried in here is an x86 of some kind and uh, software uh, that's um, running it and standard uh, components and so on. 
Um, and so these are controlled by software, but also there's a whole lot of software behind them. Um, the, they're programmed, the ballot description and so on is uh, programmed by computers in the county office before the election, and at the end of the election, the results are fed into computers that, uh, that tally the uh, results from all the different machines. So not only are these machines computerized, everything that supports them is computerized. And we also have computers that support, you know, the voter registration process and, and so on. So not only are the voting terminals themselves computers, there are computers all over the place in any modern um, election. Uh, managing the database of who the voters are, producing the poll books that list who the voters are at each polling place, and all of that stuff. So we have now evolved very quietly to a situation where the integrity and the security of the election depends on the integrity and the security of the software and the hardware at every step of this process. And, um, you know, the correctness of the software and its resilience is really critically important because in a, in a lot of cases, we can't tell who won the election if that software had been compromised. So we're really depending on that software to know reliably who the winner was. Even if we find out that the software was compromised later, we may not be able to, the data may not exist to produce an accurate count, um, particularly when we use DRE machines. Um, software, as I'm sure everybody here understands sort of intuitively, really sucks. We don't know what we're doing. Um, we don't in particular have, I mean, we call ourselves software engineers. We are the worst engineers ever uh, by comparison to like people who build bridges. If you build a bridge and it collapses, your bridge building days are over. Um, if, you build a so if you build software that has bugs in it, um, you know, what they, they tell you is, oh, good, now you have a job fixing the bugs. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty bad at that, and we're bad at it for fundamental reasons, right? We, we're not bad at it because only dumb people go into computing. We're bad at it because computing is genuinely really hard. And one way it's hard is that we, uh, we even have theorems that say we can't look at a piece of general purpose software and tell what it does in any meaningful way. We can only kind of randomly test and hope we've tested the right things. And the more complex things there are, the harder it is in practice. So, okay, we've got software all over the place. We've got software before the election for things like ballot definition and machine provisioning and voter registration. We've got software on election day. Um, we've got software for the voting uh, terminals. We've got software for, in some cases, there's a computer that's used to check the voters in, typically a tablet. A computer called an electronic poll book. Um, and then post-election, back at the county headquarters, we've got the tally software that maintains the tally, reports out the results, and also may help us with an audit, recounts, and so forth um, after the election. All right, so we've got a number of uh, potential vulnerabilities uh, here that we have to worry about. You know, the most obvious is tampering with the results recorded in a machine. But we might also tamper with the results that end up being reported back to the county headquarters from the polling place. Um, we might tamper with the software itself that's recording the results in the first place. They may never get recorded correctly um, at all. We might have to worry about the fact that there's actually communication going on here. There is a network. A lot of it isn't the internet. A lot of it consists of um, moving physical memory devices. But if there are um, remote execution errors, it's possible um, that a, uh, a vulnerability in one component can be used to exploit vulnerabilities in other components. And one voting machine might be able to virally propagate to, uh, one compromised voting machine might virally propagate to, prop to affect the whole back end and maybe other voting machines. Um, we've got the problem of bugs, and then we've got the problem of how do you do a reliable audit here. Um, a humble observation uh, I will make is that cryptography sounds great, but it actually doesn't help with almost all of these problems. Um, and it's really, even though it's extremely tempting to do so. Okay, so d there are different safeguards that states use to make sure the software is um, working. Um, and um, basically none of these have actually helped make anything better. Um, there is a certification of vendors and equipment. It's almost always a checklist of requirements that consists of requirements like, you know, you have to indent your code. And uh, you, my favorite is you can only have one return from each function and so on. 
Um, and, but, and so the software is measured against these things, and if it meets them, then it meets that checklist. One of the requirements is not that it resist all known attacks, or that there be a mechanism in place for fixing vulnerabilities after they're discovered, or that there be you know, uh, uh, experts invited to do penetration testing from time to time, or any of the things that we normally today would associate with um, uh, you know, uh, high integrity software requirements for hostile. Um, environments. Um, so we have safeguards, but they're really not all that great. And in fact, the certification requirement effectively works against our ability to fix bugs if they're discovered, because if you fix the bug, it has to get recertified, and that's a fairly heavyweight process. So there's a strong incentive to kind of not change anything. Um, and in fact, a lot of the software we looked at at UPenn in 2007 uh, is still in use today because um, Recertifying it is, is really hard. Uh, there are currently four major vendors, um, and I, I'll just say that one of them keeps changing its name. It um, started out as Diebold, and then they got a kind of bad reputation, so they changed their name to Premier Election Systems, and then they got sold, and now they're Dominion, and it's very complicated. Uh, another is called ESNS. Those, the Dominion and ESNS are the two big ones. There's also Heart InterCivic and Sequoia, and a couple of, of minor ones. Uh, some are out of business. Um, and in every case, there have been serious problems found. So one question is how secure is computerized voting? You'd think this is just a matter of grepping for a line somewhere in the software. Uh, you know, votes for candidate equals votes for candidate plus one. That really better be in there. Uh, there shouldn't be a line that says if Democrat plus one, if Republican minus three or anything like that. You know, no funny business, this should be it. But the problem is it's, it's more than that. Um, there's the county election management software, which has to be uh, secured for things like ballot definition. Is it the right ballot? Um, the voting machine configuration and provisioning process, that's all stuff that has to be very high integrity. The election day operations, the tallying and the audit functions after the election. The voting machines themselves, uh, the communication system, the infrastructure for, for doing this, all those logistics, and then the logistics of this giant temporary workforce who's trusted to carry out security procedures uh, on this incredibly large scale. Um, and, um, you know, uh, just to give you an example, a really quick example, um, my group at Penn looked at the ESNS system in 2007. Um, they were the largest vendor at the time. They served 40% of U.S. voters. That's, that's roughly the same today. Um, and there had never been a chance to independently look at it, but the state of Ohio kind of uh, let us get access to the source code, and it was a real nice opportunity. What we discovered is that every component of it was practically on fire, um, that uh, we could compromise virtually every component of the system. Um, both the optical scan and the touch screens. We, um, uh, basically, if it had input, we could compromise it. Um, and we, if it had any kind of interfaces on it, we could use those to load new firmware. And uh, we ran out of time typing everything we found in um, uh, uh, on these machines. Now, the interesting thing is you might say that's just singularly bad, but other groups, other experts, have looked at the other voting systems, and this is pretty much the typical result. Um, and, uh, you know, that is, is kind of an unchanged constant. Essentially, the bottom line is every current voting system out there has known vulnerabilities in it. Uh, there is no current piece of voting hardware or software that has been examined that we don't know has exploitable vulnerabilities in it. Now, that's not the same as saying that they're being exploited because there are, you know, there are other considerations. But uh, they are, um, but we do know that pretty much every piece of software involved in voting is um, not what we would call high assurance, high security software by any, by any measure. And everybody who's looked has, has seen this. There have been numerous academic studies. The DEF CON voting village uh, that we uh, ran, which I'll talk about very briefly in a moment because uh, you too can look at voting machines. Um, has, you know, people discover over the course of a weekend new problems each time we do it. Um, so we were very lucky that a few years ago we filed for an exemption to the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, so, so the, um, and we got it. Um, basically, we, we said we wanted to have, allow for good faith security testing of consumer products. 
And the Copyright Office granted it, and they said, oh, by the way, voting machines are consumer products for the purposes of this exemption. Um, so please go look at voting machines, too. And um, uh, you know, basically it allows you to, if, you have, if you're a good faith security researcher and you're not engaged in actual copyright infringement, you're exempt from some of the anti-circumvention provisions of the DMCA, uh, and it's really been great. Um, so we took advantage of this uh, to create a voting village. Essentially, this makes it legal to go buy a voting machine and reverse engineer it and look at it and look for vulnerabilities. And so we decided to kind of do that at scale and uh, put together uh, for the last two DEF CONs a weekend long voting machine hacking village where you would come in and take a voting machine apart and tell us what you found. And people each year find new things um, um, wrong with them and discover that the old things that were wrong with them are still wrong with them. Um, and you know, it, it, there's a, now at this point an aftermarket in um, you know kind of slightly broken voting machines that counties get rid of. So there's a plentiful supply of voting machines. Go on eBay, you can you can get one. Um, and if you want to play with it, you can do that, and it's basically legal to do it as long as you're not actually infringing on any copyrights. Um, okay. Um, so what should we do? Is the big question, and that's where I want to start. So um, if you ask random people on the internet, they're pretty much unanimous that there are two things that uh, we should do about this. One is get rid of all this computing, right? Don't use any software, hand count everything. Computers have no place in elections. Um, and the internet is pretty unanimous about this. The other thing the internet is pretty unanimous about is that we should be using more software. Vote on the blockchain. We should have software everywhere. So um, the, there's almost no middle ground that anybody advocates. It's either get rid of computers from elections altogether or uh, com, um, uh, put our elections on, uh, on uh, the blockchain and use computers at every step. So I want to drill down at these a little bit. So let's look at the no software extreme of this. Um, that basically says, you know, just hand count everything. You know, don't use computers. So unfortunately, um, U.S. elections are the most complex in the world. We have the largest number of ballot choices of anybody, in, certainly in any democracy. And it's not clear that at scale you could conduct a reliable election without some assistance of computing. Um, somewhere, certainly for managing the voters, for defining the ballots, uh, managing all the different ballots we have. Imagine doing that without a word processor. Um, imagine managing a voter registration database that uh, people are entering and leaving without being able to use a database um, and you know having to do it on, on cards. We, it, particularly as we've advanced to a society where people move around all the time and their voting location changes. Um, um, at uh, um, you know much more frequently than they they did in the past. Our population is increasing. Our number of eligible voters is increasing, um, and it's more than just the voting terminals themselves. It's the entire back end, which we're also relying on. It's easy to focus on the voting machines, but that's actually looking at only a corner of the problem. Um, and accessibility matters um, too. If you know without computing computing. Uh, aided assistive technology. It's really hard to imagine how some people who are able to vote on their own today would be able to cast their ballots without human assistance, without someone else learning how they voted or the, have the opportunity to fix their vote for them to something other than what their intention was. Um, so, you know, uh, for all of these reasons, it's really, it's a really hard sell to say that computers have no role in elections. It's, it's, it's kind of a non-starter. Um, computing is used because it solves actual problems that election officials actually have. Uh, the question is how do we get the benefits of computing without the risks associated with software? So the other end of that spectrum is more software, you know, just use the blockchain. And I got to say, this is a really tempting one because the blockchain kind of sounds exactly perfect for this. Um, it, you know, you've got a decentralized, immutable ledger that you can't delete things from. Isn't that kind of what we want? And then by consensus, you can figure out who won the election. Isn't that what kind of elections are about? We want to have a consensus about who won. But actually, um, you know, elections are actually pretty centralized activities. They're quite hierarchical. There is a, um, 
uh, you know, there are legal authorities who decide who won an election. We don't decide who won an election just by kind of the random consensus of the people who run the blockchain. We decide elections because they get certified by officials uh, that, uh, that have been legally authorized to do that. But more importantly, um, this doesn't actually solve any of the problems we have. It just creates some new ones. Because there is simply no way to put something on the blockchain or tell what was on the blockchain without relying on software. Um, you know, this is something we can't possibly do that doesn't depend on the integrity of the software used to create it. So all the problems with DRE voting machines, that they might not be recording the vote properly, still exist if you're using a blockchain as your data structure at the back end. It's just, you know, a slightly different um, integrity check mechanism that does nothing to, to, to actually prevent tampering, and it just makes us inherently locked in to the use of software to uh, actually cast or count ballots. Um, so um, it addresses tamper detection. It doesn't address tamper prevention. Um, and that's a, a kind of fundamental problem with cryptographic mechanisms generally. So just, you know, stop with this. Um, uh, it, 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 it doesn't help. Um, so uh, what happened this year? Probably the single most important thing that happened in voting uh, was the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine um, released a, what's called a consensus study where they bring experts in to write a study that reflects the current scientific engineering consensus about a subject of public importance. And they did one on voting security. It was a, quite anticipated. They spent a couple years um, writing the study. Um, they invited people to come and testify to them. Um, I was not one of the members of the study, but I was one of the reviewers of it, and I also um, uh, gave them some input, but they heard from you know, many, many different people, and they did a really careful job producing this, this large report called Securing the Vote. Um, you can download it um, from the National Academies of Press. If you Google Securing the Vote National Academies, you'll find it. It'll try to get you to buy the ebook or printed book, but then there's a download free PDF link, so it's a little IQ test um, that uh, um, if you uh, if you fail it, you have to donate 40 bucks to the National Academies, but if you pass it, you get the free PDF um, just by finding that link. Um, it is the single best document on voting security that I think has ever been produced. Um, so I, I, I strongly, uh, strongly, strongly recommend uh, this. And what it embodied was, you know, it carries kind of enormous weight. It embodies um, two really important principles in its recommendation. The first was one that was uh, proposed by uh, Ron Rivest, the R in RSA, um, and uh, WAC from NIST. Um, and it was this concept called software independence, which isn't quite what you might think from the name. The uh, concept of software independence basically says a voting system is software independent if an undetected change or error in the software cannot cause an undetectable change or error in the election outcome. And then there's a concept called strong software independence, which basically says if there was an error, you should be able to recover from it and recover the true vote. And uh, so this basically provided a formalized requirement for election system architecture, um, that it not depend on software for the integrity of the outcome. It doesn't say you can't use software. It says you have to design your system in a way that if the software fails, you can, you can figure out what happened and you'll be able to detect that there was a problem and then do an audit that will let you recover the full result. Now it doesn't, the fact that they came up with this requirement doesn't tell you how to do it. This is not a particular way of doing it. It's a test that your election architecture should pass um, according to this sort of desired uh, criteria. And the National Academy study very strongly embraced this as a, uh, as a requirement. And the Election Assistance Commission had also uh, recommended this, but we now have kind of a, a, a very strong weight behind this. The second is a technique for achieving software independent uh, systems in computerized elections uh, called risk limiting audits. And uh, there are many parents to risk limiting audits. Um, one of the most important is uh, uh, Peter Stark from uh, uh, Berkeley. Uh, this is basically a statistical method uh, that you can use with things like optical scan paper ballots uh, 
um, precinct counted optical scan paper ballots for doing a statistical meaning, statistically meaningful sample of voting precincts that you hand recount and compare the results of your statistical sampled um, uh, list of precincts with the computer reported results from those precincts. And if they match, um, then you, and you've done the sampling correctly, randomly, and, and sufficiently, then you can get very high confidence that the machines you didn't sample were um, also behaving uh, correctly. And uh, if you do this right, you can get a very, very high confidence interval exceeding our ability to just do a complete 100% hand count of, of everything uh, always. Uh, so this is a very powerful technique, and the nice thing about this technique is we don't have to invent a new kind of voting machine to do it. Uh, this works with a type of voting machine that we already have, the optical scan precinct count uh, machine. Uh, so we could just do this tomorrow by buying um, uh, new voting machines in the places that need them with off-the-shelf products and have a legal and policy regime that has risk-limiting audits built in. Okay, so am I more optimistic or less? And yes, I am. Um, I think we've made progress. It's been slow, but actually positive. Um, the National Academies report carries real weight. If you haven't read it, you should read it. Um, the nice thing about National Academies reports is that members of Congress and their staff read it and pay attention to it and accept uh, the results when it talks about anything other than vaccination. Um, so it's, um, um, you know, so it, it really carries uh, uh, quite a bit or climate. Um, but, you know, for stuff other than vaccination and climate, um, it, it, you know, both sides of the aisle really, you know, give this a lot of weight. So, you know, it doesn't say a lot of new stuff, but it says it, uh, you know, with a pretty clear message that this is the consensus of the community. So I recommend that you, that you read it. I recommend that you recommend to your member of Congress, uh, your, your two uh, senators and your, your uh, House uh, representative, that they read it, and your county officials and Secretary of State um, read it. It's really, really important. Um, paperless DRE voting machines are not extinct yet, but they are definitely moving in that direction. They're becoming a more and more endangered species, and that's great. Um, states are switching to optical scan paper. They're not all there yet, but, but it, it is moving in that direction. An important thing to do, a lot of these machines are at the end of their life or near the end of their life, and it's important that states not replace them with the same thing. Uh, the counties not replace them with the same thing. So as your county is procuring new voting machines, have input and encourage them to, to get the, you know, get optical scan paper. Some states are starting to uh, employ risk limiting audits by statute. It's starting to catch on. Uh, Colorado is, is sort of the leader in this, but there are a couple of other states that, have, uh, that are starting to do this. So it's starting to catch on, but there's no national standards um, there. Federally, there have been bills in Congress to kind of do something like a Help America Vote Act II that basically says you can buy new voting machines as long as they're optical scan paper and you do risk limiting audits and provide funding for that. Um, uh, those bills haven't actually passed yet, but so far almost all of the bills in Congress on this have been pretty good. Um, you know, as a tech policy person, I'm used to sort of trying to throw my body on the gears of le bad legislation. And in this case, we're actually trying to lubricate it and make it work uh, harder, so it's a little unfamiliar. Um, but uh, but we, there, there have mostly been good legislation here. So, uh, you know, get involved, read the National Academies report, it's really great stuff, and share it with every elected official or el and elections official that you can get your hands on. Um, so thanks very much. I think we have time for like. So I think we have time for like, you know, half a question or something. Yeah, use the microphone if you would. Hi, I'm doing great. Uh, that was your, thanks for your question. Yeah, I got two parter. <laughs> one, but while there are unlimited vulnerabilities in the voting computers, and you talked a bit about the possibilities, what is the likelihood, in your opinion, that the vulnerabilities would actually be exploited to sway a national election? It is a really great question. Um, so here's the paradox that we've got. The great question is, are these vulnerabilities being exploited? And here's the paradox. We've known for a while these machines are awful. 
We've also not found any evidence of actual exploitation in elections. What's going on? I don't know. It seems that there's probably an attack honeymoon that the attackers haven't quite caught up yet. And if that's true, then it's, you know, we've got this kind of time bomb that we're, we're sitting on. Uh, and, you know, we better fix it before they start exploiting it. So on that cheerful note, thanks very much. <laughs>